Pediatric Endocrinology Group. I welcome you all for this CME today. So today we have the theme of glucose. So glucose homeostasis and metabolism is very important in pediatric day-to-day -day practice because we face both hypoglycemia as well as hyperglycemia in our uh, daily practice. So uh, we are uh, very grateful and uh, uh, that uh, today we have speakers from Bengal as well as all over the India. And most uh, importantly, we are very lucky to have Professor Shutugangka Chaudhuri sir with us for moderating this uh, session as chairperson. So uh, just give me a second to share my screen. So uh, we have uh, Professor Shubhanko Chaudhuri sir, uh, who needs no introduction. Sir is Professor and Head of the Department of Endocrinology of IPGMR NSSKM Hospital. Sir has held many of the official positions so far, member of Subject Expert Committee of CDS CEO Government of India, founder patron of South Asian Federation of Endocrine Societies, Chairman of RSSDI, West Bengal Chapter, past editor-in-chief of Indian Journal of Endocrinology and Metabolism, and past president of Endocrine Society of India, immediate past president of the Endocrine Society of Bengal, and uh, sir has many publications in peer-reviewed journal. So on behalf of Bengal Endocrinology, a pediatric endocrinology group, I welcome you, sir, and uh, please uh, uh, have... Uh, 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 please uh, continue as the chair of this session. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Ishita. And it's wonderful to see this pediatric endocrine group developing, uh, even in our own state. It's doing in other parts of the country as well. Uh, this evening, uh, as Ishita has mentioned, uh, the focus is on glucose, glucose-related abnormalities. We do understand that uh, Though we are concerned more about diabetes, hyperglycemia, but nature uh, is concerned more about hypoglycemia. And so we have four different hormones to keep up the glucose levels, whereas there is only one hormone to reduce the glucose level. And uh, we shall have interesting talks uh, looking at diabetic ketoacidosis, Fortunately, I must say that over the years, uh, even during my uh, lifetime in clinical uh, medicine, the incidence of ketoacidosis has possibly come down, but more importantly, treatment, I think, has become much more efficient and uh, mortality has definitely decreased significantly. Of course, there's much more to be done. But uh, I think that's a very welcome uh, improvement that we have seen over the years. The other different topics, of course, are uh, type 1 diabetes, which is so very important and uh, requires uh, not just medical advice, even beyond that, I think support to the child, more importantly, support to the family is important. We may or may not be able to discuss all these issues in this evening's program. And finally, uh, the issue of hypoglycemia, and I, I understand it's not related to diabetes. Uh, spontaneous hypoglycemia, which is another major problem and leads to a whole host of complicated uh, discussions regarding inborn errors and metabolism and so on and so forth. So I'm sure at the end of the day, we will have uh, light at the end of the tunnel and a relatively easy way to guide us through evaluation and management of hypoglycemia in pediatric uh, uh, patients. So over to back to Ishita to take us through the different talks. Yes. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, so uh, today, uh, the first topic of discussion is <clears throat> uh, troubleshooting in diabetic ketoacidosis. So uh, as we normally uh, and commonly face 
various patients in pediatric ICUs with diabetic ketoacidosis. But while managing those patients, we also uh, come across various troubles which needs to be addressed properly. And uh, it helps in guiding the patients and better care of the patients. So discuss this very important and practical topic. Today, uh, we have with us Dr. Anurag Vajpayee. We all know, sir. Sir has done his MD from All India Institute of Medical Sciences, followed by FRACP and SCE. Sir is consultant pediatric and adolescent endocrinologist of Regency Hospital Limited, Kanpur, and Fortis Memorial Research Institute of Gurgaon. Sir is secretary and treasurer of ISPE 2017 and 18, and uh, he is also secretary of Grow Society of IIP Kanpur. Sir, as we all know, sir is the director of Med E classes and uh, section editor. Sir has been section editor of endocrinology of Indian Journal of Pediatrics and sir has been trained in Royal Children's Hospital Melbourne and edited six books related to pediatric endocrinology. Uh, there are plenty of book chapters written by sir in pediatric endocrinology and more than 40 index publication in pediatric endocrinology and there has been th more than 300 presentation in state national and international conferences. So sir uh, I welcome you on behalf of Bengal Pediatric Endocrinology Group. Thank you sir. Thanks a lot, Dr. Ishita, and uh, it is indeed a pleasure to be part of this wonderful program and initiative, and I like to really congratulate Dr. Hriday and uh, Dr. Sumana for uh, this wonderful initiative uh, under the guidance of uh, Dr. Apurba and Dr. Shubankar, and I'm sure this is really a good sign for pediatric endocrinology in the country in the way it is now growing across the country, and I am sure uh, these initiatives will go it further in that regard. Now, as uh, has been discussed by Dr. Shubhankar, the DK fortunately is coming down. At least in that perspective, it has been picked up more. In our estimates, most patients with DK were not even diagnosed earlier. But now the issue is to go beyond the quality to the quant from the quantity to quality as to how we can improve the quality qualitative management of DK by achieving the best possible outcome. And while we know that there are a lot of protocols available in a very easy manner, ISPAD, ISP, SP, all the societies have got their own protocols. Often on practical terms, we do lack in terms of implementation of that protocol. So this talk is more directed towards what should ideally be done and how we adapt to circumstances which are unique to our settings. Uh, there's a famous saying that DKA is very easy to manage, but we often tend to complicate that. And this is something which will be the theme of this topic. Today, I'll focus on, so this was a four-year-old girl with DKA who had been treated with fluid and insulin outside and came to us with hypokalemia for potassium level of 3.2. Now, by the time the patient we were getting involved in this setting had already received normal saline followed by insulin, and unfortunately developed cardiac arrhythmia for which a lot of things had to be done to prevent further complications in that perspective. So this was clearly a case which is not uncommon in our setting, late diagnosis, already received fluid and insulin, presenting with hypokalemia. And if we had just given potassium in the hydration fluid, we could have saved this outcome of arrhythmia happening in that regard. Second was a very, very complicated case, 12-year-old girl with DKA who had developed renal failure, hypophosphatemia, rhabdomyolysis, and then was on dialysis. And now this girl was going better in terms of the metabolic parameters, but suddenly complained of a leg pain, developed swelling in the leg. And at that point of time, uh, we really realized that this was actually a deep pain thrombosis. Now, this is again a big message which we'll give in that perspective that you should avoid putting central line in DKA because of the hypervascular state. And if you do, you should have a prophylactic heparin. So these two cases of uh, missed potassium in the initial phase and missed heparin can have a huge consequence as we'll see through this. And this highlights the need for very, very careful management because while we are improving in terms of qualitative care, we need to go much further in terms of quality improvement in DK in that regard. So we'll be talking about troubleshooting about various aspects of potassium, phosphorus, acid, what to do in special circumstances. And that will be relevant in a way, individualizing DK care beyond just a routine management in that perspective. Now, all of you can go and have a look at our website, learning.growsociety.in, which has got a lot of resources on pediatric endocrinology, including this presentation, a video form, which you can access uh, freely, along with various other practical tools which are available. 
Now, as Dr. Shubanka was saying, that body is predominantly trying to avoid hypoglycemia, and therefore there's only one hormone which is preventing hyperglycemia, and that is insulin. Now, insulin deficiency, along with the excess of all the counter-regulatory hormones, the growth hormone, cortisol, epinephrine, and glucagon, causes multiple problems, and both are important in DKA. Insulin deficiency triggers a process of lipolysis, ketogenesis, and ketoacidosis, which results in abdominal pain, rapid breathing, and fruity odor, while it is mainly the counter-regulatory excess, along with insulin deficiency, which causes greater production of glucose from alternate substance causing hyperglycemia, which then causes osmotic diuresis and loss of a lot of sodium, potassium, and water, causing dehydration, hypokalemia, and hyponatremia. The, this overall process has a huge impact on the body, and we all know that DKA is associated with around 7 to 10% dehydration. And what we need to understand is that we generally tend to overestimate dehydration and DKA. So we need to be careful in not giving too much fluid. Better to have a one step lower correction in that regard. And this is very important because giving too much fluid may do more harm in that perspective. There's also a significant deficit of sodium to the tune of around six millimoles per kg. But we tend to overestimate this because of the pseudo hyponatremia caused by hyperglycemia for every 100 milligram per DL rise in glucose levels, the sodium falsely goes down by 1.6. So whenever you are actually getting a sodium report, always correct it using a corrected sodium formula, and then you will know what is the true sodium deficit in that regard. Potassium also is hugely deficient, 4 to 6 millimoles per kg. But unlike sodium deficit, we tend to underestimate potassium deficit because in the situations of insulin deficiency, the sodium potassium ATPase channel is not working that much. And therefore, you will have much more potassium coming out of the cells. And that's why the potassium will be falsely high in that perspective. Now, once you treat with insulin and once you correct the acidosis, potassium will really be pushed into the cells and we have to be cautious. For every 0.1 fall in pH, the potassium level goes up by 0.6. So like we correct for sodium, you should also correct it for the potassium as well. And that becomes absolutely important in that perspective. Now, within this perspective, now we know that diabetes and DKA is largely a situation of insulin deficiency fluid depletion, and excess of counter-regulatory hormone. The first step we often do is giving the fluid, and this itself causes volume expansion along with decline in counter-regulatory hormones, causing around 100 to 150 milligram per day decrease in terms of blood glucose. Now, this is significant in the first hour. So if you give insulin at that time, you will find a significant fall in glucose, which is an effective osmol and that can cause more problems. So never start insulin in the first hour of therapy. Fluid alone is good enough. Subsequent to that, you have to start insulin because this is required for correcting ketoacidosis. And this typically decreases our glucose by around 60 to 100 milligram per DL per hour. And because acidosis takes much longer to resolve, there would be a time when glucose has come down while acidosis is persisting. And then you have to give both fluid, insulin, and dextrose in that perspective. Now, our study from Regency CDR shows that it takes approximately six to eight hours for glucose to come down, 10 to 12 hours for ketones to come down, but acidosis resolves after 14 to 18 hours. This gap between the resolution of ketosis and acidosis of six hours is largely because of hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. And if there is no hemodynamic instability, no features of renal failure, good urine output, it may not be appropriate to continuously prolong treatment. In that regard, we can give a break and often they will improve and this all chloride will be washed out by the urine in that perspective. Now, we also need to be aware about the complications of DK, and the most deadly one is cerebral edema, which involves a combination of a direct neuronal injury because of severe disease, along with osmolar shift because of too much fluid, soda bicarb when it was given earlier, and this two are the major both osmotic and neuronal injury mechanism in that perspective. Cerebral edema has got a high mortality and morbidity and can be prevented by giving less amount of fluid, 
less than 40 ml per kg in the first four hours and less than three liter per meter square in a given day and treated immediately with mannitol, which is superior as compared to 3% saline in terms of neuronal injury. There's the second biggest complication, which may become more important now is hypokalemia, which often is exacerbated by correction of acidosis and insulin therapy. We have to be cautious in that regards. And of course, as discussed, there could be acidosis, which may represent persistent ketosis infections or hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. Now, very importantly, this acidosis should not merit bicarbonate, which has got a lot of complications already discussed in that regards. There's also increased risk of infection, increased risk of thrombosis, therefore avoid uh, a central line in that regards. And as required in the second case, we should ideally be giving a prophylactic heparin in that regards and rhabdomyolysis, particularly because of hypophosphatemia, which can cause significant elevation in creatinine and renal failure in that regards. Now, we have shown in our study published in Indian Pediatrics that cerebral edema in Indian setting can actually happen right at diagnosis. And this is something which is very, very important. Children who have received outside treatment and those who have the first presentation of with DKA are the most likely. So if you have a child whose pH is less than 6.9, CO2 is less than 10, has received fluid outside and it's presenting for the first time, very, very high risk of cerebral edema, which you need to be bothered. And we'll see how we individualize care in that perspective. So the management of DKA involves a tight rope. In between, if we give too little fluid, we will have dehydration, slower correction. If we give too much fluid, we will have cerebral edema. If we give too little insulin, we will have slower correction, maybe after a few hours. If you give too much insulin, we will have hypokalemia. Now, anybody would guess that whether we want to have a slower correction with a longer stay in some dehydration versus rapid correction causing cerebral edema and severe hypokalemia and potential death. The answer clearly is that the mantra of DK management in 2022 is going slow, slow fluids, slow insulin, and that's very, very important from that perspective. So they asked this because there are three phases. First, you give normal saline just to correct the bolus in that perspective, followed by deficit and maintenance over 48 hours, start insulin, add potassium, because unless you add potassium, there would be a significant problem, and dextrose when the blood sugar is less than 300. No soda bicarbonate, and be aware of cerebral edema is what is absolutely important in that perspective. Now, once you get a call for somebody who has DK, first of all, secure airway. Very, very important. Uh, if a patient had recently taken a sugary drink and unconscious, put a nasogastric tube, empty the gastric content, because otherwise, once the gastroparesis improved, there will be significant hyperglycemia, which will happen. Put in two white bone lines, oxygen and catheterization, depending upon the sickness of the patient, but avoid putting intubation because intubation will cause paradoxical CNS acidosis, increase CNS pressure. So if you can avoid, avoid ventilation, avoid putting in a catheter, a central catheter, if you have to do it, give heparin as required and giving too much fluid should also be avoided in that regards. Now, hydration very simply is over 48 hours. We follow the 4 to 1 formula for maintenance and deficit and evenly distribute over 48 hours, you may deduct the first hour fluid which is given in that perspective. Now, most of us use normal saline. Studies have shown that whether you use normal saline or half normal saline, less rate, more rate is the same, but those are largely from uh, developed countries may not be relevant from our setup. So often normal saline will be better, less than double maintenance. And if a child is more than 30 kgs, use body surface area in that regards. Studies have shown that plasma light may have a lower risk of hyperchloremic acidosis and may be preferred in certain settings in that regard. Now, insulin should ideally be given as a slow intravenous infusion. Intramuscular insulin can be used in some of those settings where it is resource poor. You tend to use 0.1 unit per kg per hour, but there are studies which show that lower doses are also equally effective, particularly if somebody is an infant and somebody has got malnutrition, 0.05 would be a preferred dose in that regard. Always flush tubings to avoid the lack of delivery of insulin in the first few hours because it is bound. Do not change the insulin too frequently and do not over dilute it in that regard. 
Once you've started treatment, monitor for sensorium, which should improve uh, hydration, which should improve urine output. Very important, should be more than one ml per kg per hour. Fall in urine output is the first sign of renal failure, and renal failure in DK is deadly in that regard. Corrected sodium should be stable. Potassium should actually rise because if you're not correcting, you should know that. Otherwise, there'll be a fall. And ketones, as discussed, will go down in that regards, in that perspective. Now, how do we troubleshoot? If the potassium level in the beginning is less than 3.3, start potassium right away in the hydration fluid. If it's 3.3 to 6, start it in the normal after the correction fluid. And if it's more than 6, it should be avoided or if there is anuria in that regards. If somebody has polyuria, myopathy, think of hypokalemia. And in that setting, you may start with a potassium infusion and along with that reduce insulin because the patient will die because of hypokalemia and not because of prolonged decay in that perspective. And often we tend to find that there is magnesium deficiency, which is also there in that regard. If the blood sugar is more than 300, that insulin alone is good enough. If it's between 200 to 300, you add 5% dextrose. And if it's less than 200, add 10% dextrose, and that's important. Uh, otherwise, there will be significant hypokalemia, which will happen. What about bicarbonate? Now, remember, there's no role of bicarbonate. If you have acidosis, look at ketones. Ketones more than two, such as ketoacidosis. Less than two, you calculate the chloride load, which is essentially sodium minus chloride minus 32, or use an anion gap. If the chloride load is less, it is lactic acidosis. If it's high, it's hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. And most of these cases will come in the hyperchloremic range. Do not need to do anything. They will improve its self-resolving condition. Bicarbonate is in uh, cause of CNS acidosis, hypokalemia, lactic acidosis, and should be avoided only in very, very cases with severe life-threatening hyperkalemia and hemodynamic instability. You can give it as an infusion in that perspective. What about phosphorescin? Phosphorus is one player which we are missing and we will recommend that with severe DK, always look at phosphorus. If it's less than one, ideally start potassium, phosphorus and chloride right at the beginning because we have seen many cases where abdomyolysis will kick in. Otherwise, if it's more than one, you give KCL and monitor the level. Very important if somebody has persistently altered sensorium, myopathy, rhabdomyolysis, think of hypophosphatemia, treat with potassium phosphate along with calcium monitoring in that perspective. Now we have set the theoretical aspect, which was essential to have the basis over the next seven minutes or so. I'll go through about the various cases just to highlight individualized care in DKA. So this is a 10-year-old girl with a blood sugar of 540. There is significant acidosis, pH is 6.9. There is 10% dehydration. So what about bolus? Do we give bolus in this case? Of course, she's quite sick. We have to give bolus. Also look at the sodium levels. So sodium is 130, but if we correct, it's 137. So she doesn't have hyper uh, hyponatremia in that regard. So we'll give maybe 10 ml per kg of sodium chloride is good enough. What about duration of correction? Now, there are some features of severity, but the pH is more than 6.9. The girl is reasonably uh, old age. There is no other outside treatment. So less risk of severe edema, we can correct it over 48 hours. What about potassium? Now, potassium is 5.8, whether we give potassium. Now, just to illustrate, the corrected potassium in this case is actually 2.8 because pH is 6.9. So this girl, as soon as you start insulin, will develop hypokalemia. So potassium, yes. After you have given the correction, the initial uh, bolus, then you can start potassium. And finally, what are we worried about? I'll be really worried about cerebral edema and hypophosphatemia. So I'll be a bit careful and maybe I'll order a phosphorus level at that point of time. And if the phosphorus, as in this case, is around 1.1, we have to be cautious whether we add potassium because phosphorus will also fall as soon as you give insulin and maybe add potassium right from the beginning to prevent hypophosphatemia. So this is a typical run-of-the-mill case of severe acidosis, correct over 48 hours, give potassium right from the beginning, consider severe edema very quickly, and phosphorus is something which I'll give as an important tip in that perspective. Second scenario of an 11-month-old boy who is uh, otherwise having uh, a pH of 7, ketones positive, sugar is high. Now, how is it different from the first case? 
My major concern here is that this is an infant and we have to be cautious in terms of correction. So bolus, yes, we will give a bolus. What about insulin? I would be a bit cautious about the duration of correction in this case. Maybe we can go up to 72 hours because the acidosis is not that bad. Slower will be better in that regard. You don't want to give too much fluid in that regard as well. What about insulin? I'll prefer a lower dose of insulin in that regard of 0 0.05. Some units say you use 0 0.05 for everybody, but we would prefer definitely for infants. Very much precautions in terms of cellular edema. So in an infant, the key message is use lower dose of insulin and do a gradual correction over 72 hours may be desirable in that regard. What about this nine-year-old girl who is quite emaciated? The acidosis is not that bad. Ketosis is not that bad. What do we do? Do we give bolus? Yes, she's dehydrated. We'll give bolus. What about duration? Now, again, we have a child uh, who has reasonably old, so 48-hour correction would not do a harm. But I would be very, very cautious with insulin because this girl will have a high risk of hypokalemia. So give 0 0.05 unit per kg per hour. The major risk here is in terms of hypokalemia. So in malnutrition, start with a lower insulin, monitor potassium, monitor phosphorus, monitor magnesium to a greater level in that regard. Four-year-old girl, she has been treated outside has a pH of 6.9, has drowsiness and an isochoria. Now, this is a lethal combination. pH less than 6.9, CO2 less than 10, CNS features, impaired GCS, somebody treated outside. This is without any doubt cerebral edema. So whether we'll give a bolus? No, this is going to cause more harm. Duration of correction, because it's cerebral edema, over 72 hours. What about insulin? We will prefer to give a lower dose because our major concern is not to cause a rapid shift further. Very much this is established cellular mind free. So somebody who has a very low pH, low CO2, has low GCS, always think of cellular edema right at diagnosis, which is something which is very often in our setting you have to worry about. Now a three-year-old boy with severe DKA, pH is 6.9, bicarbonate is 5, ketone is 6.4, and potassium is 2.8. Now what are we looking at? Something which is steering is the potassium, of course. So bolus, we will give bolus, but we will add potassium right at the beginning. Insulin, we have to withhold because if you give insulin, this potassium will crash and the child will die of hypokalemia. Duration again, 48 hours precaution, mainly in terms of hypokalemia. So if your initial potassium is very low, if there are ECG changes, right away in the first bolus, you give 20 millimoles per liter of potassium right away and do not give insulin till your potassium has gone above 3.5 in that regard. Now, nine-year-old boy, pH is 6.85, CO2 is, 2 point, is 9, bicarb is very, very low, GCS is also low, potassium is 3.6. So again, a very classical case, no bolus, correction over 72 hours, low dose insulin, and be aware of both hypokalemia because his potassium is just 3.6. So I'd be very cautious about this, low dose insulin, both for that perspective and maybe defer also, and that is very, very important. Now, on follow-up, at eight hours, he complains of headache. So we did all those measures, but he still has headache. So what do we do? We find the DTRs, which are brisk. GCS is still on the lower side. What do we do? It's clearly cerebral edema. You give mannitol. Do not wait for imaging because the child will die if you wait for that. Mannitol, head and elevation, and all those measures will have and reduce the fluid rate by around 30 to 40 percent, and that will improve over time. Now, at 12 hours, the same child now develops oliguria. And as I said, monitoring urine output is very important. Any hour, the urine output is less than 1 ml per kg per hour, start thinking. Now, creatinine has crept up 1.4. There is a leg pain and there is an area which looks tender and which has which feels tender in terms of legs and urine shows 40 to 50 RBCs. So what's happened? I said the very high risk of hypokalemia. And when you have low potassium, your phosphorus will also be low. So this is a clear-cut case of rhabdomyolysis. You have to be very, very bothered. And once you have renal failure, this is a very difficult situation. I will say don't do anything. Consider hemodialysis very early. You may give an initial bolus and see whether the child improves in terms of urine output, but prepare for dialysis. Otherwise, the child will have severe problems. Your fluid will go into the lungs, in the brain, and cause many more problems. So oliguria, leg pain, 
hematuria, whether it's microscopic or gross, a bad sign in decay, renal failure, correct phosphorus in that regards. At 18 hours, ketone is 2.2, come down, pH is acidosis is persisting, bicarbonate is still low, there is hypokalemia. So what do we do now? There is hypokalemia and the acidosis is persisting. Now, what you need to prioritize here is that this child is not going to die because of this bicarb of 12. He may die because of potassium of 3.2. So best would be to give a potassium bolus and stop insulin for some time till your potassium goes up. Now, this is what I discussed earlier. Had received dialysis and then presented with leg pain, swelling, and high D-dimers because of DVT. So whenever you put a central line in somebody with DKA, always give a prophylactic heparin. That's a very, very important message to individualize in that perspective. Now at 24 hours, ketones have gone. Lactate is normal. Bicarbonate is still low. So what's happening? So as I said, if you have a child who's otherwise fine, there's persistent metabolic acidosis, renal function is also normal now, think of a hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis and that's very, very important. Uh, and in this setting, clearly it's hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis which will go off in some time in that regard. Now, after DK, and this is again a challenge which is there, started on sliding scale, two units per kg per day, sugars are up and down. So what do we do? We should have shifted him right away from a basal bolus regimen with giving a long-acting insulin at night before you start to switch over to subcutaneous and then you give three times a day with a gap in that perspective. And we have specific modules that they will require much higher doses in the initial phase. Otherwise, it's going to be a huge problem. So when you're planning to switch to subcutaneous insulin, give a long acting the night before, start at a high dose up to 2.5, start with basal bolus, you will have much faster correction and much rapid improvement in that perspective and in that regards. Now, we have shown that despite all the protocols, teaching, training, and everybody, everything in that regard, there's a significant number of errors which creep in with regards to management of DKA in various regards in our own unit. And that really causes a lot of problems in the form of hypoglycemia, hypokalemia, and dehydration. So what we have done is that we have developed an application which uses the ISPAD guidelines, providing individualized guidance based upon the level of pH, the CO2, potassium, age, ketone levels, not only in terms of the initial management, but also in terms of the subsequent management. So once these inputs are put in and we get these information in based upon the algorithm. There are multiple outcomes available. It will tell you what should be the initial fluid, what should be in the hydration, the dose, the fluid, and all the calculations are done as far as this PET protocol. And this has been shown to improve quality management. So what I'm trying to say is that there's a need for individualized care. The first hour of therapy is most important. So if areas where there's issues, you should go for in that regard. So you can all go and have a look at our website to look at all these uh, informations which are available, including this presentation. Our courses are available and this application which provides information on DK is also available. It's being published as a paper in, that, uh, in IJP coming up very soon. So I think um, I'll close at that point of time and invite questions uh, from there. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for this wonderful session. Uh, so we would like to have uh, from uh, Shubhankar sir, Chaudhary sir. I, I think that was a masterly presentation and in a very crisp man manner. I'm sure uh, there was a lot of ground that he covered. Uh, one may have uh, wanted a longer time being allotted to him. Uh, a few, few words. Uh, Firstly, uh, in the management of DK, I think the most important is monitoring and documentation. So have a flow chart with you, whether it's electronic, whether it's physical. Unless you do that, you are not likely to pick up because so many things are uh, going on at the same time. So please, in every case, uh, uh, make a flow chart whatever the GCS, the amount of fluid that's going in, the urine output, the electrolytes, the blood gas analysis, the ketones and everything. And as you get other investigation reports, uh, that should also be put in. So that's uh, the key, I think, in order uh, to 
detect early and also to preempt many of the complications. The other uh, areas, of course, I think he is uh, very well uh, illustrated through his examples, including the concept of corrected potassium level, not this corrected sodium, the corrected potassium in relation to uh, the pH. About the heparin use, uh, I don't know, I mean, I have not been using, I mean, we, we are slightly less concerned, probably inappropriately, in, in, in thrombotic complications in DK compared to, of course, uh, uh, the uh, hyper or smaller uh, states that we also see more in adults. But yes, they, that is also an issue that uh, is to be considered, possibly not in every patient that we, we start heparin, but of course in selected uh, patients we would uh, need to. So, uh, I mean, th those would be my brief comments, and then uh, we can, uh, Nidoy or whoever Ishita can take up the questions that are there. Uh, there, there must be some. Uh, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, I can see one question by Dr. Biplav Maji. Uh, he asked uh, how to give phosphate. Yeah. So I think just to answer Dr. Shubankar's point regarding the uh, addition of heparin, so we restrict it only for those who are have to have a center line put in. So we uh, we avoid center line, but if you're doing a HD or you're doing something else, then you give heparin. But hyperosmolar is definitely a, requires a heparin in most cases anyway. Now, this is a very important thing. So now potassium phosphate is available readily. The cost is also not too much. Ideally, so the ideal recommendations have been that you give uh, the potassium correction 50% as potassium phosphate and 50% as chloride. Now, we have not been doing because phosphate has not been available traditionally, but now it's available. So if you have a very severe decay, you can give correction using both phosphate and chloride. It is better. If the documented phosphate is less than one, no confusion, you have to give that. Remember, you will have a falsely high phosphorus also as you have a falsely high potassium because the insulin deficiency and acidosis will also cause the same thing. The phosphorus will come out of the cells. Once you start insulin, it will go into the cells. So I would say this is a very, very important point. We now routinely, anybody who has a pH, which is less than around 6.9 or lower, we send a phosphate and start potassium phosphate. But as the guidelines say, you can use both potassium chloride and potassium phosphate in everybody. Yeah, it's available. It's easily available as KFOS uh, in that regard. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for your wonderful session and this I, valuable I have comments. One, one question for uh, sir. Uh, actually, uh, I think you have mentioned all the uh, points here, and uh, we frequently uh, get these questions from actually paid nephro people. And high frequently, we can uh, land up in AKI in DK and what may be the causes and how to prevent it. I think you had already mentioned it just mm -hmm. for a revision and a few yeah. points. Yeah, I think that's a very, very valid point. And I would say AKI is often missed in uh, uh, DK. Uh, if we talk about mild elevations in creatinine, you can actually, if you look at EGFR and other factors, you will see 10 to 20% may actually have some form of AKI. But these are often reversible. These include both pre-renal factors because of dehydration, sometimes tubular necrosis. What we are worried about is usually a severe renal damage or rhabdomyolysis. So I would say that somebody who is very sick, whose phosphorus is low, you may develop rhabdomyolysis and that is maybe around not more than 3 to 4% in those scenarios. But mild AKI is common, which is not going to help you a lot. We have been monitoring CPK in our patients with DK, and we I would say the figure of the high CPK is somewhere to the tune of around 10 to 15 percent, which will correlate with some rhabdomyolysis. But if you talk about severe requiring dialysis, I would say it's not more than two to three percent than that. But remember, if you have oliguria, give bolus. If the child is not responding, be ready with dialysis because that's what they will save. Otherwise, they will die immediately because too much you're giving too much fluid. You're not passing it out. It's going to be in the lung, in the brain. That's a major problem in that setting. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, Ishita has put a question uh, yeah. about the use of regular insulin rather than analog, right? Yeah. Yes. Sir. So, yeah, but, uh, uh, 
Yeah. Yes, please, please. Yeah. Not so, uh, yeah. So, uh, definitely, you're talking in terms of the chronic management, I believe, because for acute management, we will use regular insulin anyway. In terms of the IV insulin, the regular is effective. For chronic management, the differences in terms of the regular insulin versus the analog is largely in terms of the risk of glycemic variation and hypoglycemia. If you look at HbA1c, there's not a huge difference. So, if you don't have availability of analog insulin, Definitely regular insulin is what we can and we should use. But if somebody is affording or if there's some way the centers can provide it, the quality of life, the fluctuation, the variation, the risk of hypoglycemia, the lower for analog insulin. But that does not obviate the use of regular insulin where the resources are causing a constraint in that regards. For acute IV correction, because the major difference is in terms of the hexama formation after subcutaneous, it doesn't you, have, you should use regular insulin only for that. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I can see one more question. Do we? Uh, it's from Dr. Robi Vishwas. Uh, yeah. How potassium is corrected where potassium phosphate is not available? We use potassium chloride. That's the standard one. I think he wants to ask about phosphorus phosphate being corrected because otherwise potassium chloride is the standard one which we've been using throughout. Yeah. Now, potassium phosphate is, I would say, if phosphorus deficiency is there, we don't have any other way. We have to give potassium phosphate, but otherwise routine potassium chloride is very good. The problem with potassium chloride is that it may cause hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. It may contribute to that. Uh, otherwise, it's a good one in that uh, perspective. Yeah. Uh, and thank you, sir. Uh, if no one has any more question, then I would uh, move towards the next session. Thank you, sir, once again. Uh, so coming to our next session, uh, it's actually uh, we now have learned quite a lot about DKA management, but I'm sure in our PG days, we usually uh, used to manage those DKA patients, but what happened to them after the uh, resolution of DKA, we had very uh, little uh, insight or we uh, regarding all those things. So the, our next session is ambulatory management of type 1 diabetes patient. Uh, this is quite frequent and uh, I think it's a very important topic compare, uh, when it comes to the day-to-day -day OPD pedi uh, pediatric practice for all of us. So uh, just So now our next session is uh, for uh, ambulatory care of type 1 diabetes patient. For this, uh, I would like to invite Dr. Uh, Runa Mojumdar, ma'am. So ma'am is a consultant pediatrician with special interest in pediatric endocrinology and diabetes in AMRA Mukundapur and Park Clinic. Uh, she has done her CCST in pediatrics and neonatology from UK. And she has been a specialist register in pediatric endocrinology and diabetes in Leeds and Bartford Hospital, UK. Uh, she uh, was elected as fellow of Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health in 2021. Uh, she has several publications and presentation both nationally and internationally. So uh, welcome, ma'am. And uh, uh, please, uh, uh, sir, if you have anything to say, Chaudhuri, sir, then uh, otherwise over to you, ma'am. No, we will we'll, uh, get on to the talk. I have done my initial brief introduction. So it's over to you, Rola. Thank you, so thank you Ishita. Thank you, um, Professor Chaudhary. I'll be talking about ambulatory care in type 1 diabetes, um, a condition that um, is one of the most common conditions uh, of chronic disease in children, uh, type 1 diabetes, that we see on a regular basis. And its management is very crucial, as we all know, and challenging uh, to prevent long-term complications of diabetes. Uh, the importance of a multidisciplinary team is very crucial in this condition. And um, we know that the incidence of type 1 diabetes in, is increasing rapidly at a rate of around 3% every year. And the management here is not only treating the child with diabetes, with insulin, uh, monitoring the insulin, tailoring the dose. Um, uh, not only that, but it is important for the pediatrician to actually work with the family in tackling all the social, economic, 
um, and other school and other transition care for the um, for the child in a skillful and compassionate manner. Here, it is uh, very important that we must, um, you know, consider this as a art as well as a science. So, coming to the objectives of my talk. I would be just going through the diagnosis of diabetes, which we all are aware of, and assessing a child who initially presents with type 1 diabetes in clinic uh, or in um, emergency, um, going through the insulin therapy and monitoring, edu diabetes education, nutrition, and psychological support, which form the cornerstone of the management in this condition, going on to the benefits of exercise and lifestyle management, and then how to tackle emergencies in a child who has been diagnosed with type 1. I will interrupt, Runadeep. Can you please make it full screen, your presentation? We can't see it properly. Um, Sorry. Can you make it full screen? Sure, sure, sure. Sure. Um, and then going on to the management of the emergencies uh, while we are treating this condition, mainly hypoglycemia and sick day rules, and then going on to follow up and long-term goals of management. So first, going on to the diagnosis, the ADA guidelines 2016, we all know that the fasting plasma glucose of more than or equal to 126 in a child um, is defined um, as diabetes and fasting is defined as uh, no calorie intake for at least eight hours with a two hour uh, PP sugars after having 75 grams of glucose of more than or equal to 200. The HbA1c of more than or equal to 6.5% and a child who comes in with hyperglycemia or hyperglycemic crisis and a random glucose of more than or equal to 200. So classification I'll go through quickly. We know that type 1 children the, are the commonest that we see and then we see moderately few type 2 children and very few MODI patients. So the onset in type 1 is usually in all ages. We can have any age presenting with type 1. And very commonly in DK, obesity is very rare. And we usually see the GAD antibody being positive. But in Indian children, 20 to 30 percent may be negative over time. The C-peptide levels here are low. In type 2, we see that usually in type 2 and MODI, both they are pubertal children, with the DK rate being very rare in both. Obesity is a common presentation with acanthosis in type 2, and the GAD antibody levels are negative in type 2 with very high C peptide levels. Here, due to glucotoxicity, we can also see a low C peptide levels in type 2. MODI, we would see a negative GAD level, a GAD antibody level, as well as a normal C peptide. So, usually, when do we classify? When we see obesity and acanthosis, we say that this is type 2, usually. If we see there's a lack of ketosis and there's no family history, we will think about um, uh, basically the, since there is no family history, then type 2. And if there is an onset before six months, we will think of neonatal diabetes. So a child presents at six years of age in type 1 diabetes, we diagnose as type 1 diabetes with high blood sugars and an HbA1c of 9.4% with very low ketones. So what do we do with this child now? Firstly, during assessment, we see that this is a newly diagnosed diabetic. We should first, no matter what the condition of the child is, rule out DK. We look for the blood and urine ketones, the HbA1c to see what the sugar levels have been over the last few months. See the antibody, autoantibody status. We have to do the thyroid and the celiac screen. We see the hydration of the child and also see if the child has cataract. If the child presents before one year of age, this child isn't, but any child who presents before one year of age with negative antibody levels, we must think of neonatal diabetes, which is a very challenging and difficult condition to treat. And if we see a prepubertal lean patient without ketosis, we think of MODI. So the types of insulin, coming to the variety of insulin, the traditional regular insulin are the hexamers, which have a delayed onset of action, and there is a long gap. And these are really not ideal, especially not for the infants and toddlers. The MPH variety, again, we can see that there is a very, they have the problem of variability. There is a clear peak though, but
but they cannot be given as a single dose, but a twice daily regime. So the standard of care would be a short acting insulin with meals and a basal insulin um, as a bolus. So aspart, Lispro and the glulicine are the normally used as the short acting insulins who have immediate onset of action and they're more predictable and more flexible for infants and toddlers. And there is a background insulin, either we use Detemir or Glagine, which, is, which are peakless and they can be used um, in a once daily regime. So what, what do we actually aim for? We aim for um, mimicking the physiological insulin secretion in the body, which we can never achieve. Actually, it is quite impossible to achieve a portal delivery. But what we can do is try to mimic the physiological insulin action. So what we want is a delivery system, a system that detects the insulin, the blood, sorry, the blood sugar in the body and gives the titrated dose of insulin to match this and automatically shuts down when there is no sugar level, when the sugar levels in the body drop. So this is what we need, which mimics the normal physiological secretion, or in other words, an artificial pancreas, which is still in the making and still a mirage for the child who has been diagnosed as a type one insulin, sorry, type one diabetic. So the insulin requirements for any child pre pubertally is normally at the range of 0.6 units per kg per day. Pubertal levels are usually one to 1.2 unit per kg per day and post pubertal levels are usually one unit per kg per day. As we have heard in the previous talk, after DK, we need very high levels of, in, uh, of insulin to the tune of two to 2.5 units per kg per day, which again come down during the honeymoon phase and then uh, plateau at the age the child is in. So for this child, we would think about a mixed split insulin. Now the decision about an insulin regime depends on the financial status of the patient as well as the education status because they need to be informed well as well. So um, for this child, we think about a mixed split insulin um, in the first instance. So we can give a long acting insulin and uh, a, sh a short acting insulin with meals so an intermediate acting insulin, which can cover from breakfast to lunch and a short acting insulin for dinner, that would mean that we could have to give only two doses uh, of insulin, but that would also mean that there could be hypoglycemia when the child is not eating. So this is ideally not what we would want. And as we have discussed earlier, we would, if the child can afford it, we would go for a basal bolus regime, wherein we can have uh, long acting insulin um, given and then the bolus regime given during the meals. So here the incidence of hypoglycemia is minimized. So insulin therapy is normally given in the areas that are colored, we all know, and it is given um, subcutaneously at an angle of ranging between 45 to 90 degree, 45, depending on the um, obesity or the leanness of the child. It's usually stored in conditions two to eight and always remember to give them education regarding travel um, with insulin should not be taken into, uh, in, into the packed luggage and things like that. And it should not be frozen, stored appropriately because the effectivity of the insulin uh, will decrease, diminish drastically if it is not stored appropriately. A rotation of the sites of insulin is extremely important in every clinic appointment because um, if it is, the sites are not rotated, they do not act and can lead to lipohypertrophy, as we all know. So coming to the, uh, you know, the insulin pump therapy, which is something that we need to think about and move on to for patients who can afford this, we give insulin, the same rapid acting insulin as a base, basal and a bolus. Now, the advantages of the insulin pump is that it can, the basal rate can be decreased in times like exercise, it can be stopped when we need to. It can be increased during, uh, you know, periods when we think that this, like the dawn phenomena, we need to increase the insulin requirement is increased. Therefore, we need to increase the basal rate. Again, if we need to increase it when they are sedentary after dinner. The bolus rate also can be monitored and tapered according to the meal that the child has. So this is ideal. This will mimic the normal physiology of insulin secretion in the body to the maximum. 
Now, the insulin pumps um, use only the rapid acting insulin analog for both basal and the bolus. And um, latest pumps have also got the sensor augmented pumps, which have the CGMS in it pre-built um, with predictive modeling. Uh, it is not very easy to use and it needs a lot of input from, uh, you know, from the medical team to be able to manage this, as well as the fact that the child should also be taught, um, you know, made aware of everything because um, we have seen that in several studies, the use of CGMS has been decreased drastically because they, um, they get really fed up after a while using it on a continuous basis. But these pumps are very good for children who are small because they have a very grazing pattern of feeding, especially for the ones less than five years of age. So it offers more flexibility. It gives more precise insulin delivery. It causes a decrease in the HbA1c in several studies. Also, we know that recurrent hypoglycemia causes, um, you know, impairment of cognitive development in a child. And hence, this is reduced drastically if we um, do use the insulin pump. If, if there are uh, fewer episodes of hypoglycemia, the ability to also stop or suspend the rate of uh, the basal rate during exercise is an advantage. Uh, there have been studies to show that there's, there has not been any weight gain by the use of the pump. And the there has been some infusion site reactions, but these can be minimized if we can use it properly and change the infusion sites. There have been some psychological issues related to the pump, but in general, they have been shown to be positive. There has been less anxiety, more of self-esteem, uh, less depression, and better fa family functioning, reduced parental stress if the pump has been used with more freedom of use and more flexibility. Now, when do we use the pump? When there's recurrent severe hypoglycemia, when there are wide fluctuations in blood glucose, when the control is not optimal, when there are microvascular complications, there may be good metabolic control, but it compromises the lifestyle. In young children and infants who don't have a regular pattern of eating and they're grazing through the day. In adolescents with eating disorders, the children who have got needle phobia, who have prolonged dawn phenomena, where we need to decrease the basal rate, children who are ketosis prone. So all of these conditions, we have to think about the pump if the family can afford and they are well educated. Most importantly, DKA can be avoided if the correction dose is given with the pump or a syringe. Now, diabetes education, this is the most important cornerstone of management. And starting right from the diagnosis, we have to explain to the parents that this is a lifelong disease and the only treatment is insulin. No sort of alternative treatment will help. We have to teach them how to administer. Usually children above eight years of age, we ask them to do it themselves and um, how to store the insulin. We have to teach them how to do the glucose monitoring extremely important, otherwise we would not know what the sugars are doing. We have to talk, uh, talk to them about the healthy diet. A dietitian has to be involved in the management, very importantly, and teach them about carbohydrate counting, glycemic index, about the honeymoon phase when they think that they can stop the insulin now because the doses have, increased, uh, have decreased drastically. They have to be told that this is a phase that will come, but they are not getting cured of the diabetes. To manage the insulin, with variable sugar. So they must maintain a diary and we must review this at every clinic appointment and help them and teach them how they should change the dose of insulin according to the sugars. How to adjust the insulin doses. In emergencies like hypoglycemia and sick day rules, they cannot be allowed to, be go, uh, to go home without knowing how to manage these two conditions. Extremely important. And how to manage the whole condition to prevent complications long-term because that is our long-term goal. So nutrition. A diabetic child and normal healthy child eats the same. There is no special diabetic diet. The calorie intake should be 50 to 60% of the total carbohydrate from which 10% should be simple, 15 to 20% protein and 25 to 30% from fat. This should be regular food timings and the quantity of food should be more or less the same. There could be alternatives offered. Carbohydrate counting should be taught to all parents and the insulin dose adjustments, very important and a snack should be advised prior to uh, exercise. They must be taught how to manage festivals and how to manage parties. Uh, the normal growth in a child is the most important indicator of calorie 
sufficiency. Now, blood glucose monitoring, people ask you how many times do you monitor? I always reiterate the more times you do, the better it is for your control. At least, you know, pre-meal sugars should be done. So four times a day for all children who have the tea as well. And a 2M sugar at least twice weekly should be done. If there's any episode of hypoglycemia, we must do it again. So glycemic goals would be for children who are less than six years, around less than 8.5% of HbA1c. And the children who are in their teens, we are more stricter, but generally across the board, we would like a target HbA1c of less than 7.5%. So insulin adjustments are usually done with the pre milk sugar, if it is in the hypoglycemic range, you know, coming down to 70 or less, then we would decrease the long acting and give the rapid acting after the meal. If it is 140 above, then we would want to increase the long acting. And it's if it is above 200, then obviously increase it 20% and also change the timing of the uh, rapid acting insulin to before the meal. So six weeks, uh, you know, going back to the child that we were discussing, six weeks follow up, he comes to clinic with high sugars before dinner. He is on a long acting glargine and a lispro insulin short acting with bolus uh, regime. So then we, we see on his uh, chart that he's actually having a tea time snack, but with no insulin at all at tea time. So we have to add this short acting insulin at tea time. So usually in a six year old, I do not give them a tea time insulin initially, but when we notice that there is high sugars uh, before dinner, we must add in a tea time insulin. So that would give us a four time uh, bolus regime with a long acting insulin separately. So three months later, we see that this child comes with low sugars across the board of 50 to around 50 to 70. Then we realize this child is in the honeymoon phase and we must teach them why this happens. And this will not, you know, be long term. So because of the correction of the glucotoxicity, we know that the residual beta cell function has recovered. And therefore, we see that he does not require as much insulin as he did initially. And this will last around six to 15 months duration. If we notice in a child that this lasts for longer and he needs very little dose of insulin, we must consider to the maturity onset um, diabetes of the young as, an, as the alternative diagnosis. Now, 18 months later, this child presents with high values across the board with the same dose of insulin and some erratic normal values. So then we must think about lipohypertrophy, which is very important. We must examine the child at every clinic appointment to see where they're giving their doses and whether they are getting lipohypertrophy. After three years, we notice that this child has very poor weight gain, very needing low doses of insulin and the sugars are also low. So we must think of doing the thyroid function test, the cortisol, the celiac screen and renal function test, because these are the conditions where insulin requirements decrease. Now, now the child is 13 years old and he's 56 kilos. He has high sugars, particularly high before breakfast, before dinner and the 2 a.m. sugars. And we all know that this is possibly due to Dawn's phenomena because he is now going into puberty and he has increased pubertal hormones. Therefore, we must increase the dose of insulin. So the long acting insulin has to be increased. Now, annual screening is extremely vital and we must do it on a regular basis. We have to measure the HbA1c to see what the child has been doing over the last three to four months. Thyroid screening at diagnosis and annually, celiac screen at diagnosis every two to three years, and the uh, blood count and creatinine should be done to see the renal function. Lipid profile at diagnosis and yearly after every, after the child reaches ten years, urine albumin creatinine ratio the same. Growth monitoring extremely crucial because how well we are managing our diabetes depends on how the well the child is doing growth wise blood pressure should not be missed and the pubertal status of the child should be done once he reaches puberty retinopathy screen very important at diagnosis and yearly at 10 years after 10 years of age now dental health is increasingly becoming important and last year we did a, a, a big presentation on dental health in type 1 diabetes, we do know that, you know, adults with diabetes do have a lot of dental issues, periodontitis, but now we do realize that children with poor glycemic control suffer from quite bad dental caries. 
And the last but not the least psychological assessment is extremely crucial as the child is growing older and reaching puberty. So coming to the emergencies, we know that managing hypoglycemia is extremely crucial and we must teach the parent and the child that hypoglycemia is something that they will come across. So when the child um, has an episode of hypoglycemia, he normally has palpitation, tremor, and anxiety as a neurogenic effects or sweating, hunger, and paresthesia. He may have neuroglucopenic effects after, which would involve headache, jitteriness, seizures, apnea, and coma, and muscle weakness. Now, hypoglycemia unawareness is something that we must be aware of when the neuroglucopenic effects come first. And this is very difficult you know, to manage because we don't know in the middle of the night when the child has um, an episode of hypoglycemia. Therefore, the 2 a.m. Uh, levels are very crucial. So we would manage by giving glucose, a sugary drink, and increase the uh, level up above 100. If once they are above 100, we give them a small meal of a long-acting, long-lasting long carbohydrate and reduce the insulin dose. If the child has severe hypoglycemia, then we must keep glucagon at home for every child with type 1 diabetes, give 0.5 milligram IM if the child is less than 25 kilos and 1 milligram if he's above 25 kilos, and then admit the child in hospital and give uh, a 10% dextro solution of 2 ml per kilo IV. And follow, at follow up, we must find the cause we have discussed previously, reduce the dose of insulin, or see if we need to change the regimen because we know that the traditional regimens cause more hypoglycemia and if possible, we should go on to the MDI. So the sick day management, every child will go through these episodes of fever, vomiting, diarrhea, and we know that we must teach them how to manage this sickness. So encourage fluid intake, treat the incurrent, uh, intercurrent illness, see what the blood glucose level is. If it is low, then we must omit the short-acting insulin, decrease the basal dose by 20 to 50% and recheck the blood glucose after one hour. And um, yeah. uh, yeah. we are just running a little short yeah. of time. Yes, I'm going faster. So, and okay. if the sugars are higher, then we would um, see the blood ketones and decrease the, uh, you know, give the in increase the extra insulin by um, depending on the ketones. So if they're large, then 20% increase in the total dose. If they're small, then they, you know, 5% increase. So never stop insulin, extremely important. Febrile in illness, increase 10%. In gastroenteritis, decrease 10%. This we must remember and keep monitoring the sugars and ketones. Physical activity, I know you are, are well aware that exercise is extremely important because it improves the glycemic control. It, it uh, you know, they require less insulin, they require, you know, uh, they improve the cardiovascular uh, health of the patient, as well as, um, you know, uh, we will also increase the insulin sensitivity with increased physical activity and do not inject into the site which is involved with the muscular, uh, you know, increased muscular activity. And avoid hypoglycemia by giving some sort of a carbohydrate before a meal, before a exercise. So psychological aspects, as you know, is crucial we must, they go through several stages and we must be very, um, you know, cautious in evaluating this and do not neglect the psychological aspect of any child with type 1 diabetes. Introduce them to support groups. I always introduce my patients to senior experienced families who can help them overcome this, these problems. So we know during surgery, we have to take special care of our diabetic children and, you know, change the, uh, adjust the dose of insulin and give them IV fluids with the, uh, you know, uh, uh, sliding scale insulin uh, requirement if needed and pay more importance to fluid and electrolyte balance. Adolescence is a very important, crucial time where uh, we have to manage transition care very effectively with the adult physicians, uh, adult endocrinologists. So here, this is a time where we must work with them together so that we can address all the issues that, you know, and they can smoothly go into transition from the childhood to, um, you know, to adolescence. The complications we are all aware of, and this is, you know, our goal is to prevent these complications. Uh, and that is why it is crucial for us to manage this condition appropriately. To summarize, um, type one diabetes is one of the commonest chronic disease in children, and it needs a multidisciplinary team approach, minimum a dietitian and a psychologist with 
the endocrinologist. Patient education, nutrition, and exercise being the cornerstone of management. And we are looking towards newer advances in diabetes care, earlier diagnosis through genetic and immunological testing of high-risk children. You know, then we can improve uh, versions of artificial pancreas, administration of insulin by alternative routes, nasal and oral, which we have been hearing about in the last few years, um, development of stem cell therapy to generate a genetically modified artificial pancreatic cells for transplantation. So basically, these are, um, you know, things that we are looking at, and uh, we, are look we are looking forward to. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for this wonderful session. Uh, sir, do you have any comment? Or otherwise, we will uh, take the questions at the end of the session because we are running short of time. As you please. Yeah, so you could go ahead. Yeah, yeah sure. Uh Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. So coming to the final session for today, uh, we have discussed about hyperglycemia so far, but hypoglycemia is equally common and quite a important problem or the condition that we face uh, regularly in our pediatric practice. So uh, without waiting much, I would like to invite Dr. Rajini, ma'am. Hello. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ishita. Yeah, ma'am. I just wanted to introduce you. Uh, ma'am, as we all know, ma'am is additional professor at All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. Um, she did her MBBS and MD from uh, Ames, New Delhi only. And uh, she was awarded Sir Dorabji Tata Prize for Best Undergraduate Student in Biochemistry and awarded RCPCH Ashok Natwani Visiting Fellowship in GOSH in 2015. And she has 65 index publication and 28 book chapters. So without wasting further time and apologizing to you once again for waiting you for so long, I would like to uh, over uh, yeah, give over to you for the final session. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Ishita. I was rather enjoying the sessions. Dr. Anurag is my senior, and uh, Dr. Uma also I enjoyed the session very much. So, uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate Dr. Sumana and uh, uh, for this meeting and uh, Bengal Endocrine Pediatric Endocrine Society. And it's great honor to be here with Dr. Chaudhary as well as Dr. Ghosh in the meeting. So I will just start sharing my slides. Can you please, can you see my slides? Yes, we can, we can. So I'm, I'm going to discuss this topic, pediatric uh, hypoglycemia made easy, but I don't know how easy I can make it. It's a little, I mean, always a very challenging, but if we just keep few things in mind, then we will be able to deal with most of the cases. My slides are not moving somehow. I don't know. Uh, so glucose is an essential fu uh, fuel for cellular function, as we all know, it, to generate ATP in the cells. And organs such as brain, heart, muscles, and kidney are dependent on glucose. And our blood glucose is maintained in a very narrow range of 60 to 140 milligram per dl. So uh, in the absence of glucose, when it is low, we have alternate uh, fuels which can be used, especially free fatty acids can be utilized by muscle and heart, and ketone bodies can be utilized by the brain. Free fatty acids cannot be utilized by the brain because they don't cross the blood-brain blood barrier. And as we all know, as pediatricians, hypoglycemia can cause brain damage and long-term neurological sequelae. So it's very important to manage, to diagnose and manage it appropriately. So as far as the definition goes, a lot of controversy regarding the exact uh, uh, the number. But we all know that generally at around about 70 or so, that is four millimoles or 72, milligram per dl, the counter-regulatory hormones uh, come into effect and some adrenergic symptoms may be evident like sweating, palpitations, and um, so they may be seen. As it reaches around about three millimoles or 54 milligram per dl, then the neuroglycopenic symptoms also appear like um, uh, we can have uh, jitteriness, uh, uh, the child can be a little lethargic and in newborn, uh, the infants, the symptoms are more like uh, more subtle, like they can have uh, jitteriness and uh, hypothermia. And as the blood sugar goes further down, cognitive dysfunction, coma, seizures, and death may even occur. So uh, these are the various points. And uh, generally, we define it as a blood sugar less than 40 milligram for the first day, 
and beyond the first day in a neonate less than 46 mg per dl and beyond the neonatal period a blood sugar less than 54 mg per dl is defined as hypoglycemia. So let's just understand basically a little bit about the pathophysiology. So as we know, as in the, in the fed state, when the blood glucose rises, there is secretion of insulin and uh, this leads to a deposition of glycogen in the liver and also uh, lipogenesis uh, and fat deposition as a response to insulin. Coming to the fasting state, which is important to understand in case of hypoglycemia, uh, in the fasting state, uh, the insulin levels start falling and the glucagon levels start rising. And as a result of this, due to the fall in insulin and rising gly glu uh, glucagon, the liver uh, starts uh, releasing glucose by glycogenolysis. And after six to eight hours, other counter-regulatory hormones also come into effect like adrenaline, cortisol, and growth hormone. And all of these hormones, basically they result in gluconeogenesis from amino acids and lactate. And also the low insulin and the high counter-regulatory hormones lead to breakdown of the fat, that is lipolysis, with release of free fatty acids. And these free fatty acids are converted into ketone bodies in the liver, which are used as alternate fuel by the brain. So this is basically a depiction, a graphic depiction of, to show what happens in the fasting state. So as the time uh, goes, then we can see that the glucose from the meal is decreasing and simultaneously the uh, glucose is released from the glycogen in the liver. So as the glucose levels go down, then gluconeogenesis also starts and there is a ketogenesis. So it's important to remember that ketogenesis occurs only uh, when the insulin levels are low, uh, when the insulin levels are uh, low. So if the insulin levels are high, then uh, ketogenesis cannot occur. So coming to the etiology of hypoglycemia, if we just remember these etiologies, these are the main etiologies, then we will be able to classify most of the cases. Uh, so it can be either because of decreased stores like uh, intrauterine growth retardation, small for gestational age baby, prematurity or malnutrition in which the glycogen uh, stores as well as the protein, the muscle and the fat is also less. Or it can be due to increased utilization of glucose as in sepsis, asphyxia and one very common condition which is under recognized is congestive heart failure. Many babies with congestive heart failure can have hypoglycemia. Then the third category is the inborn errors of metabolism, basically the enzyme defects because of defects in galactose or fructose metabolism, defects in glycogenolysis or gluconeogenesis or a defect in the fatty acid oxidation and organic acidemias which impede the glucose production. And the last category, the fourth category is the endocrine causes, the adrenal insufficiency, panhypopituitarism, growth hormone deficiency, and cortisol deficiency, and hyperinsulinism. Hyperinsulinism can be either primary or secondary. Secondary cause is mo uh, most commonly encountered is the infant of diabetic mother. Now, um, let us come to the etiology of persistent hypoglycemia. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'll just be coming to this um, case first. Uh, so it's important to remember that in the neonate, I'll be discussing a case of neonatal hypoglycemia. So I just want to mention that in a neonate, there are three types of cases which can occur. First is the transitional hypoglycemia. So all neonates are predisposed to develop some hypoglycemia, especially in the first four hours, which can extend up to 48 hours. This occurs, this is basically an asymptomatic kind of hypoglycemia, which responds to feeding and these babies are generally non-risk. It occurs because the baby has a transition to the uh, extra uterine life and the uh, glycogen stores are not so well developed. So you may suffer from transitional hypoglycemia. Then there is another category of the high risk babies that is the small for gestational age or the IUGR who have low glycogen stores or the ones with sepsis, hypothermia or asphyxia with increased utilization of glucose or those who have very high insulin levels like infant of diabetic mother or large for gestational age or maternal use of beta blockers. All these are high-risk babies who need to be monitored for hypoglycemia. So let us just come to this case one. This is a single term appropriate for gestational age male born by LSCS with maternal preeclampsia and cried immediately after birth. Birth weight was three kg, has poor feeding lethargy and apnea at six hours of age and blood glucose is 30. So, uh, 
this is a symptomatic hypoglycemia. So IV dextrose is given 2 ml per kg followed by GIR of 6 mg per kg per minute. And he persistently has hypoglycemia. It doesn't rise above 50 or 40. So GIR is increased. Then again, 45 minutes is checked after 30 minutes. So GIR is increased to 10. So can this be a transitional hypoglycemia? Obviously not. It is not a transitional hypoglycemia because it is occurring in a, uh, it is a symptomatic hypoglycemia. And secondly, it's not even a high-risk baby. So high-risk babies have a more severe form of transitional hypoglycemia. So this is a basically a persistent hypoglycemia. So what is the definition of persistent hypoglycemia and what is the etiology? So basically, if the GIR is greater than 10 to 12 milligram per kg per minute, further investigations should be performed to identify a possible endocrine or uh, pathology or inborn error of metabolism. And referral to an endocrinolo for endocrinology investigations are required if the hypoglycemia persists more than 48 hours. And especially if the blood sugar is not able to rise more than 60 milligram is what the Pediatric Endocrine Society says, then you should investigate for persistent hypoglycemia. So these are the two main th things that you have to remember that the child requires investigation for persistent hypoglycemia. So what is the etiology of persistent hypoglycemia? As I mentioned, these are the etiologies of the persistent. So they are basically inborn errors of metabolism, which I already enumerated, or the endocrine causes uh, like adrenal, insufficiency, panhypopituitarism, or hyperinsulinism. So these are the two major categories. Now coming to the history and the examination. In the history, we must focus on the maternal details, the antenatal and natal history, the perinatal uh, 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 events, the perinatal asphyxia, maternal drugs, if any, if the mother had any diabetes during pregnancy. Then the onset of uh, hy uh, hypoglycemia is very important. In hyperinsulinism, hypoglycemia can occur any day, time after day one. Whereas in other etiologies like glycogen storage disease, because the glycogen is not released and we know that glycogen comes into effect after six hours or so. So it generally occurs after six months of age when feeding interval increases. And some etiologies like fructosemia occur only after the introduction of fructose. So basically by the age of onset, we can know what is the most likely etiology. Then the timing in relation with feeds. In hyperinsulinism and galactosemia, it can, there's no relation to feed. The hypoglycemia can occur anytime. But if the uh, hypoglycemia is occurring after fasting uh, state in a sick baby, then it goes more in favor of adrenal insufficiency, <clears throat> inborn error of metabolism, or fatty acid oxidation defect. Then we should take a history of any jaundice, which points to hyperpituitarism or adrenal insufficiency. <clears throat> Generally, this is the conjugate type of jaundice. And then we take a detailed family history of consanguinity for inborn errors of metabolism, family history of hypoglycemia, seizures, unexplained sibling deaths, etc. Then coming to the examination, we look at the birth weight, uh, the gestational uh, age, and the, whether it was a preterm baby and was an IUGR or a small for gestational or a large for gestational age. We look for features of hyperpigmentation, which suggest adrenal insufficiency. And we always look for any syndromic features like a macrosomia, macroglossia, omphalocele, or hemihypertrophy suggesting beckwith weedman syndrome. If there's any feature of cardiac disease, then it points to a glycogen storage or a fatty acid oxidation defect. And midline defects point to hypothalamic pituitary deficient defects. So coming to the investigation, we do the critical sample, which is very important. Whenever the blood sugar is low, we must take a critical sample in children who are suspected to have, uh, infants suspected to have persistent hyperinsulinism, uh, persistent hypoglycemia. So in this, we do the plasma or the urinary ketones, the ABG or the lactic acid, and the growth hormone, cortisol, and insulin levels. These are all part of the critical sample. As far as non-critical sample goes, we must do the urine-reducing substances for uh, galact to rule out galactosemia because in our country, we do not do normal newborn screening, and it's very important to rule out galactosemia in all cases of hypoglycemia. We do the electrolytes, rule, rule out any liver pathology or inborn error of metabolism by doing the LFTs and the uric acid. A serum ammonia is sent because some forms of inborn error of metabolism, like the organic acidemias, or some forms of hyperinsulinism also are associated with high ammonia. Then we do the inborn error of metabolism screen by doing the uh, GCMS and the uh, tandem mass spectroscopy for free fatty acids, acyl carnitine profile, 
these all help in the diagnosis of fatty acid oxidation defect and organic acidemias now a very important point is a lot of emphasis is given on the presence of ketones so basically as we know ketones are formed as a physiological response to any uh, starvation or uh, hypoglycemia so norm normally ketones are always present but there are certain conditions in which ketones are absent and hence they help us in diagnosing them like in the presence of high insulin ketones cannot be formed in the presence of fatty acid oxidation defect ketones are not formed and certain other disorders like galactosemia and fructosemia ketones may be absent whereas ketones these are the blood ketones more than 2 mmol per liter or we can check the urine ketones they are generally present in glycogen storage disease growth hormone deficiency uh, and pan hypopituitarism accelerated starvation is a very important cause in which they always have ketones many inborn error of metabolism they will have ketones and organic acidemias now this uh, the ketones present or absent so as i mentioned there are physiological response to fasting so if ketones are present so most important thing is if ketones are present they almost rule out hyperinsulinism and fatty acid oxidation defect but they can also be absent in other conditions like galactosemia and fructosemia which we can rule out and sometimes they are also absent in pan hypopituitarism so the absence is not at helpful as the uh, presence if the if they are present then certain conditions are almost ruled out let's come to case number 2 this is a, a neonate with hypoglycemia on day 7 of life birth weight of 2.8 kg antenatal period no history of uh, diabetes in the mother no consanguinity or sibling death on examination he had no midline defects or dysmorphism no groove in the ear lobule or omphalocele or macroglossia suggestive of beckwith weidmann syndrome he had no jaundice or hyperpigmentation but it was noticed that his uh, stretched penile length was only 1.9 cm but he did not have undescended testes and there was other systems were normal so the presence of micropenis and and this or the uh, along with undescended testes would suggest a hypogonadism so then in this child a critical sample was done in which the ketones were negative but the insulin was undetectable and abg was normal no lactic acidosis the growth hormone which is normally more than 10 nanogram per ml at the time of hypoglycemia was low and cortisol also was very low so this pointed to pan hypopituitarism and in this case we must screen for other pituitary hormones like thyroid and lh fsh testosterone which would be low in this expected to be low and the prolactin so we would treat this case by doing an mri of the pituitary and by the uh, giving uh, hydrocortisone replacement and followed by thyroid hormone replacement coming to this case a single term female born with birth weight of 2.5 kg had poor feeding and lethargy on day 4 and on examination sick looking hypothermic with a delayed cft the blood glucose was only 20 and the septic screen is positive so is the hypoglycemia only explained by sepsis yes it could be but it's important to remember that in the absence of universal newborn screening in our country we always should rule out galactosemia because we don't want to miss it in a sick child and in this child the urine reducing substances were positive and a galt assay was done which showed no activity so this showed the presence of galactosemia coming to another case a single term male appropriate for gestational age with hypoglycemia on day 1 no risk factors and the glucose requirement was 12 mg per kg per minute so as i mentioned this points to persistent hyper uh, hypoglycemia and this case needs to be worked up so the critical sample was sent in which the insulin was 5 it should be less than 2 in a critical sample the plasma ketones were low they should be more than 2 but they were less than 2 mmol per liter here the growth hormone has also come a little low 5 nanogram per ml and cortisol levels also should normal should be more than 450 nanomol per liter this is slightly low and abg and lactic acid are normal so what does this show basically the presence of high insulin it confirms that this child has hyperinsulinism and he has recurrent hypoglycemia confirmed by lab the gir requirement is very high to maintain glycemia and the critical sample shows high insulin more than 2 with inappropriately suppressed blood ketone less than 2 mmol per liter 
So why is the cortisol and growth hormone low? It's a very commonly seen condition in these patients with hyperinsulinism, basically because they have an exhaustion of all the counter-regulatory hormones. So sometimes we may see low growth hormone uh, and cortisol levels, which is not very specific. But definitely if you have the same low cortisol and growth hormone in the presence of a normal insulin or an undetectable insulin, then it points to panhypopituitarism. So coming to the genetic etiology, there are around 15 key genes which are involved in the pancreatic insulin secretion in hyperinsulinism. And the most common mutation is in the KATP channel mutation of the pancreas. Uh, this KATP channel has two subunits. One is the sulfonylurea receptor, SUR1, which is encoded by ABCC8 gene. And the second is the potassium inward rectifying uh, channel, CARE 6.2, which is encoded by the KCNJ11 gene. And if there are any homozygous mutations in these genes, then no KTP channels are present. And this is a diffuse hyperinsulinism, which is unresponsive to disoxide therapy because disoxide acts on the KTP channels. So in this case, the KTP channels cannot be opened because they're not present and they are unresponsive to disoxide. The heterozygous is the diffuse disoxide responsive. Heterozygous mutation are diffuse, but they are disoxide responsive because few channels are present. Now this genetic testing is done free of cost at Madras Diabetes Research Foundation. So if you have any patient, you can send your samples there. So this is basically depicting the KATP channel, uh, ATP sensitive potassium channels on the pancreatic beta cell. So this, uh, it will have two subunits, which is the ABCC8, uh, encode, uh, the sulfonylurea, encoded by the ABCC8 gene and the CUR 6.2, which is encoded by the KCNJ11 gene. So mutation in any of these genes can lead to hyperinsulinism. So basically normally in the presence of glucose, when the ATP levels rise, then these channels are normally closed and uh, they, uh, they normally open and then they close the calcium channels. Okay. But uh, when the calcium channels close, then the insulin is released. Uh, sorry, when the calcium channels open, then the insulin is released. So what happens is the ATP rises, it closes these channels. After these channels close, then the calcium channels open and the insulin is released. Now what happens in this mutation is that the KTP channels are persistently closed and the calcium channels remain uh, and the insulin is continuously secreted. So this is one study that we published in Indian Pediatrics in which Dr. Kakoli also, who is a member of, this, uh, of the Bengal Society, Pediatric Endocrine Society, uh, she uh, took out most of the cases. And uh, uh, so this was published in Indian Pediatrics and 42 infants with congenital hyperinsulinism over the last eight years. And the onset of hypoglycemia was around three days of age. And the most common mutation was obviously ABCC8 in 22 patients. And uh, most uh, half of them responded to disoxide and half of them responded to octreotide. Basically, I will be discussing the uh, approach to hypoglycemia. So uh, I'll be discussing the six month old hypo child with hypoglycemic seizures who has doll like facies and a hepatomegaly. The critical sample reveals normal growth hormone, cortisol, undetectable insulin and lactate is very high and the ketones are positive. So obviously in this case, the onset of hypoglycemia at the age of six months and the doll-like facies with hepatomegaly all point to a glycogen storage disorder. So as far as the approach goes, in the investigations, we always look at the ketones. If the ketones are negative, then we look at the insulin. If the insulin is more than two in the critical sample, it points to hyperinsulinism. If it is less than two, then it points to fatty acid oxidation defect. If the ketones are positive, then we look at the lack presence of lactic acidosis. If lactic acidosis is present, then it points to a glycogen storage disorder or inborn error of metabolism. And if lactic acidosis is negative, it points to hypopituitarism or benign ketotic or star accelerated starvation. Coming to this last case, this is a one-year-old child with early morning generalized seizure and the blood sugar was found to be 30 milligram per DL. Ketones were done and they were highly positive in the urine. So how would you approach this child? <clears throat> Luckily, uh, when the child has presented to the casualty, they have checked the urine ketones. So the, mo most of the time, uh, the patient gets treated and the urine ketones are not checked. So we're really clueless as to what the etiology is. 
So as you can see here, the ketones are positive. If lactic acidosis is negative, then it would point to hypopituitism or benign ketotic. If positive, then it would point to growth, uh, glycogen storage or inborn error of metabolism. So we should have the lactic acid. So a thorough history was taken in this child. The child had missed his meals the previous day and physical examination was done. The anthropometry was normal, but he had a slightly uh, low BMI. The diagnostic, so a diagnostic fast had to be undertaken uh, for a few hours. In this case, up to 12 hours of diagnostic fast were required and critical sample was collected. Uh, in this way, we have to rule out other causes like adrenal insufficiency, hypopituitarism, and glycogen storage disorder. So what this case was, basically nothing was found and it was uh, diagnosed to be an accelerated fasting or a benign ketotic hypoglycemia. This is a very uh, commonly seen condition in infants, especially when they are, have a slightly low BMI. And if they are fasting for too long, then they can develop hypoglycemia due to lack of glycogen stores. And it's basically a diagnosis of exclusion. And the treatment consists of frequent meals, especially when the child is sick, they should keep on consuming glucose containing fluids. So the key messages are that the differentiation between the transient versus high risk versus persistent hypoglycemia in the newborn period is very important to decide which, one, which children require evaluation. We can get important clues from the history and examination. Critical sample is useful for providing the vital clues for the etiology. And especially the ketones would help us uh, direct us to the etiology. Congenital hyperinsulinism is a very important cause of persistent hypoglycemia. So basically, if the glucose requirement is up to 10 to 12 milligram, then we are almost certain that it may be congenital hyperinsulinism because these are the conditions in which such high insulin uh, glucose requirement is there. And always rule out an inborn error of metabolism and galactosemia in sick newborns. Diagnostic fast may have to be undertaken in older children to diagnose the cause of hypoglycemia and a systematic and meticulous approach towards diagnosis and management of hypoglycemia will help prevent complications. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for this wonderful session. So <clears throat> I would like to take some questions, if any, in the chat box. So, uh, meanwhile, ma'am, I would like to ask one question. What is your experience uh, regarding use of disoxide in IUGA children who had persistent hypoglycemia? And how long you have used it only for IUGA who had persistent hypoglycemia? That's a very good question. Actually, I didn't go into the treatment details much because of the time. I mainly focused on the diagnostic aspects. But yes, uh, sometimes IUGR babies, they have hyperinsulinism, which is uh, slightly prolonged for uh, many days, even up to a month, it may last. So in those cases, we may have to use diazoxide. So we have used diazoxide in such cases, especially when the hypoglycemia is persisting beyond one week. And, uh, but we almost, we should always remember that diazoxide should be used in a very low dose. The normal dose of diazoxide is around about uh, five to 15 milligram per kg per day in three divided doses. And we always, uh, but when we are using it in an IUGR baby for this indication for persistent uh, hyperinsul for hyperinsulinism, which is going on for a little longer while, then we must use a lower dose of two to three milligram per kg because they can have side effects due to diazoxide. Uh, so I can see one more question uh, from Dr. Biplab Maji. Uh, he's asking a uh, lower age cutoff for fasting challenge test. Lower age cutoff for fasting. Yeah, age cutoff. Actually, uh, I mean, fasting, uh, the challenge that we give in the newborns, we generally try to avoid the challenge because if they spontaneously go into hypoglycemia, it's better. So generally, the challenge is reserved for little older children, the diagnostic fast. But definitely, when we have a child with hypoglycemia who is going home, whom we are going to discharge, but the sugar, uh, the blood sugar has recovered, like suppose an infant of a diabetic mother, we are sending home. Now we are sure that the child is maintaining blood sugar and is fine. But we always give a, a fasting challenge of six hours before sending home. Because normal child should be able to endure a fast of six hours. And even if a child, we start on disoxide, we always uh, give a fast of six hours to show. And when we are giving that fast, the child has to be supervised and the blood sugar has to be done frequently. We just can't leave the child and 
so we uh, take up this fast it's basically not a diagnostic but it's more of a therapeutic fast for older children we do a diagnostic fast uh, children who we have started on octotide generally they cannot endure so long fast so in them it's not done it's only for those who are given been given disoxide thank so, you ma'am yes ma'am yes ma'am please continue ऑक्साइड Uh, we always uh, have to monitor the patient also frequently because especially if the patient is on iv fluids then they have a high risk of developing a congestive heart failure so always we started with hydrochlorothiazide and especially these children do require high fluid because they're on gir of 10 to 12 so it's very common to go into congestive heart failure so always the hydrochlorothiazide is given and in fact they are recommending nowadays that all these patients on disoxide should also have an eco because uh, they can develop pulmonary hypertension so in eco in follow up and at baseline you should always rule out a heart disease before starting disoxide experience of hypoglycemia in hemolytic diseases of the newborn could i couldn't uh, your voice is not coming sorry uh, what's your experience of hypoglycemia in hemolytic diseases of newborn hmm. like correct come yes it is uh, actually i don't look after the nursery but it uh, that is a common cause they don't call us for these conditions because as we know rh hemolytic disease leads to hyperinsulinism uh, stimulates the products of hemolysis stimulate the insulin release so it is a form of a transient hyperinsulinism so they do require higher girs but they generally recover uh, ma'am we have another question uh, from dr robi vishwas Uh, how should you further approach a case who is responding to disoxide who is responding to disoxide so yeah. uh, uh if the patient is responding to disoxide then obviously as i said we will undertake a fast for 6 hours that he is tolerating we will use the no uh, dose that he requires we will follow up this patient for any side effects and uh we'll do an eco in the follow up for pulmonary hypertension so these are all the side effects that are concerned so neutropenia can occur hypertrichosis can occur so all these we'll monitor but as far as the etiology goes we do undertake a genetic testing though the genetic test is less likely to be positive in a disoxide uh, responsive child because there are many genes we have identified 15 genes till now but the disoxide ones what we have seen is that we uh, get a genetic mutation only in around about 50% because there are some other genes probably which we have not which we do not know till now so uh, but we always take a genetic testing in these patients and always do an ammonia because there are some types of mutations which have respond to disoxide and the ammonia levels are high so we always do this diagnostic i have one more question uh, uh, when do you do fdg pet scan in cases of hyperinsulinemia yes so initially we were doing fdg pet in all the cases because it's available but i think in many places it's not available but what we found was that it's useful only in those who have a paternal mutation positive uh, a, mutu a mutation of the abcc8 or kcnj11 gene which is inherited from the father so basically this is a paternally inherited mutation and it's a second hit theory it says that the second mutation occurs uh, in the pancreas in the it's a somatic mutation so it's a two hit uh, mutation and uh, only these patients have focal hyperinsulinism the others don't so it's um, basically if we even undertake a dopa pet in those who are uh, responding not responding to uh, i mean who are having other mutations then it will not come positive so it's only if the paternal mutation is there so generally if they are uh, responsive to disoxide then also we will do a dopa pet because some of them have paternal mutations and even if they are unresponsive but the mutation is the paternal mutation then we will do so normally in foreign countries they first do the mutation testing and then go for dopa pet but in our country sometimes the mutation is not available for a long time and sometimes we do have the dopa pet available so we uh, go ahead with the dopa pet 
but it's not much yield without a paternal mutation. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so, uh, so I just want to uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, I ju just want to inform uh, from uh, behalf of uh, Bengal Pediatric Indignation or, or who, whoever is there in this, uh, in this uh, session that ma'am has uh, their own team there at AIMS. Uh, they will help you to uh, deal with the hypertension cases with the FBG dopa pack and uh, the genetic testings because I had already uh, sent some patients over there. So uh, you can always send uh, your patients uh, to AIMS immediately. Uh, they can help you for that because a digit is uh, not available in most of the places in our country. Thank you, Dr. Rida, for this in important comment. Uh, so we have today Dr. Apurbhagos, sir, with us. Uh, we would like to have some comment from you as well. Any comments? I was listening, and whatever the questions I had, I have already asked. But it was a fantastic session, and uh, what I feel is that um, regarding uh, the management of type one diabetes in children, um, at what age you can start using the insulin pump? Because it really gives you a very good control. I, I myself use a. Uh, insulin pump, it can stop the hypoglycemia, uh, it gives a very good uh, glycemic control, but from what age we can start in our country? In our country, I do, we don't know, but uh, in uh, outside, they are using since one, one, top, one year of age. After what age? One year. One year. In foreign countries, they say that uh, in fancy, it's better controlled with insulin pump. But um, absolutely, we had uh, a lot of patients um, who were uh, actually infants on the pump um, in the UK. But, uh, you know, because of the lack of community care here, I don't think, um, you know, we would be brave enough to do that over here. So I would rather uh, we start the pump on the older children, uh, school children who would be easier to manage rather than infants. Although, you know, the pump is better for children who are less than five years, but uh, we have to understand that there is no multidisciplinary team like it is uh, abroad. Um, so I think we have these constraints of, you know, community nursing and things like that, um, who, if the pump goes, if something goes wrong in the middle of the night or at, at times, you know, they may not have anybody to approach. So um, in that regard, I think it would be better for older children to be on the pump where they also know, you know, quickly to go on to um, the alternative regime. Um, but yes, in the UK, they have, uh, you know, we had a lot of patients uh, who were infants on the pump. So what I've seen that the pump providers, they have a 24 hours uh, service. Absolutely. So if, uh, yeah, if it's not the community nurse, they will be able to help you. But uh, it is the pump providers who will give you and guide you uh, in the middle of the night also. And whenever I had a trouble in, uh, in the initial period, now I have learned it. So I don't need any support from the uh, pump service, hmm. but uh, they give you a 24 hour service. Okay. At every point you found, uh, you've got them. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, most importantly, you know, uh, this uh, 642, the current one, it stops the uh, intuition the moment it is reaching the hypoglycemia level. Right. So, uh, so that's the uh, most important advantage because from insulin excess to, uh, uh, I mean, insulin deficiency to produce DKA in mm. a diabetic patient so will take some more time. But hypoglycemia is the one, but the current pump actually stops the insulin uh, infusion. So there is no chance of hypoglycemia until and unless your um, pump is not functioning. Absolutely. I think Dr. Choudhury has left already, so we don't have his expert comment. Um, Ishita, do you want to wrap up then? Please. Yes, uh, thank you. Dr. Supriyo Basu has raised his hand. Shupri, go ahead if you have a question. Yes, uh, Shupriyoda, 
if you have any question uh, you can directly ask or any comment i think there is a question from dr ravi vishwas that uh, how should we uh, further approach the case which uh, responding to bad side for uh, that has been already answered uh, by ma'am yeah okay. yeah so if uh, there's no any uh, no question any other then i would like to thank everyone because uh, dr runa ma'am sharma ma'am and of course uh, alva chai sir he'll probably and uh, uh, dr opugo ghosh sir because of your continuous encouragement is really what we need to go forward and uh, thank you all the members of bengal pediatric endocrinology group uh, it was a wonderful session i would also like to thank dr arun mangalik sir special thanks to somna who has done this exactly i yes of course thank you somna da for your uh patience all through the session thank you very much team ich for giving us a zoom link thank you everyone thank you everyone uh, so uh, good night to all and till we meet again thank you thank you